we go ahead and make a start, let's just quickly switch to a poll. Um, and we'd like for you to have your say. So for what reasons do you visit your local park or outdoor space? Um, so is that to exercise? Is it to socialize? Uh, is it to rest, is it to go for tranquility? Um, or is it for access to clean air? So we'll just give it about a few seconds, just so you've all got a chance. Great. So, um, perfect, so let's end the poll then. Great, well, it looks like tranquility is for the win, which is really good. So hopefully you'll find the talks today uh, really interesting or provide you some information in terms of how our open spaces are going to become more tranquil then on emergence from COVID. So let's then head back to presentation. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Susanna Wilkes, Director of Crossroad Partnership. Susanna. Thanks very much indeed, Thomas. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us to learn about parks and open spaces and the contribution that they can make to keeping our air clean in a post COVID era. We're very pleased to be putting on this event in the middle of Love Parks Week. As many of you know, Cross River Partnership was formed 26 years ago to build the Millennium Bridge across the River Thames. By now, we're actively helping with delivering London's future together with all sorts of government, business and community partners. CRP would like to thank its major funders for making this live share session possible. Central Government Units DEFRA and Innovate UK's Challenge Fund, plus the Mayor of London. CRP is delivering a wide range of projects. One of these, Clean Air Villages, is supporting businesses and communities to keep London's air clean as COVID restrictions are lifted. Another, Healthy Streets Every Day, is working across 17 boroughs to increase all of London's streets' contributions towards a clean air future. More on that later. CRP's vision is to empower people to deliver innovative projects that support places to survive and thrive. And we've always recognised the, the many roles that plants can play as well as an intrinsic part of all of these pr processes at many different scales. At a strategic level, the regeneration of Stratford wastelands into London's 2012 Olympic Games site was conceived by master planners within the context of an all-encompassing, everlasting urban green park that incorporated wildflowers, meadows, play, picnics, walking, cycling, boating, and more. Across the Atlantic, community players in New York have achieved a park-led recovery of the old meatpacking district, transforming a disused railway high line into a perfect park in the sky. At a micro scale, mini parks can help to create low emission neighborhoods planter by individual planter. These road blockers recently installed by the London Borough of Lewisham are literally using plants to keep polluting vehicles out of residential neighbourhoods, simultaneously cleaning up the air, facilitating walking and cycling, plus reminding about physical distancing in a post-COVID era. So it's all a question of balance. With the right physical distancing interventions, with meticulous guidance and regulations, with intelligent and ongoing monitoring, we can work together to maximise the physical health benefits, the mental health benefits and the economic benefits from parks and open spaces of all scales, shapes and forms. Parks and open spaces really do have a huge contribution to make. And who is better to tell us more about that than Tony Leach, Chief Executive of Parks for London. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to be with you. 
The Victorians had a good understanding of the importance of providing parks, primarily as lungs of the city. Whilst the sources of pollution of today are different, the role of parks in keeping our lungs clean is the same. Now, clearly, the best way to reduce pollution is to uh, eliminate the sources, the cars, the domestic boilers, etc. But that's just not going to happen, uh, certainly not going to happen quickly. So in the meantime, we need to mitigate the effects of pollution. And um, there are a number of ways that we can do that. We can invest in expensive air filters, as illustrated in the top right hand uh, picture of a business startup encouraging people to invest in a, a revolutionary concept for cleaning the air in polluted cities, which is basically it's a, an ex, uh, a fan that sucks in dirty air, puts it through a series of filters and blasts out beautiful, pure, clean air. And they have the audacity to call it uh, a clean air park. So that's one way um, and probably hugely expensive. And I don't know any any countries doing that. Or we could invest in our parks and green spaces. And, and we know from research that um, parks are, are really effective. Any green space is effective at um, improving the quality of the air, you know, taking out the nitrogen oxides, um, the uh, carbon monoxide, and by filtering um, particulates. Uh, it can also have negative effects in that uh, in very high temperatures, the um, uh, ozone levels can increase. And uh, for, for the poor um, people who are allergic to pollen, uh, that can be a side effect. But leaving aside that, uh, parks and green spaces have a huge contribution to keeping our air clean um, so that we can live a, a much more healthy life. The challenge I see as being the in London anyway, in many uh, urban areas, is that the distribution of parks and green spaces in London um, are not strategically or fairly distributed. Um, even with a, a pretty good planning system. And if we were to sit back and uh, be planning London from scratch today, we probably wouldn't put the parks where they are today. But we have to work with what we have. And COVID has shown us that there's a correlation between poor health, lack of green space, and sadly, COVID deaths. So whilst parks matter, uh, I, I'm going to be... Uh, uh, a heretic here uh, running a charity called Parks for London. I'm going to say that um, though parks matter, it's all green space and particularly green infrastructure when we're thinking about more densely urban spaces where the capacity to build new, new green spaces is very limited. And also it, it's a, an important issue to consider the journey of individuals from their doorsteps to uh, their daily activities being school or work or social. Um, those routes are really important and that's why green infrastructure is of crucial importance where the creation of green space is not possible. Um, just one other point, this, this photograph in the bottom right um, gives, uh, you know, an an atypical picture of a park, but it does illustrate very well that the tree canopy is well provided for and the ground level, but there's an absence at the, uh, the personal level, the shrub layer, and, and it's that, that layer that can really make a huge contribution to filtering out um, pollution. Oh, it's gone forward too, sorry. Okay, so uh, I really want to, to commend to you a report produced by the GLA last year about using green infrastructure to protect people uh, from air pollution. It gives some really good tips and tricks um, about the uh, use of uh, different types of planting in different settings to improve the quality of air. And, and as I said before, it's it's the different layers of planting that contribute to uh, a, an holistic approach to filtering the air. Trees are well known for that. We're seeing more sustainable urban drainage systems introduced, which allow for planting 
roof gardens are increasing in numbers and vertical planting as well. What we're not not been seeing much of are, are the introduction of more hedges and hedgerows. So there, there's a challenge. And the health and well-being benefits of parks are, are well documented and evidenced now. And Jacqueline will mention more about those later. But I just wanted to draw out the fact that the economic benefits can now be quantified through using natural capital accounting. And one of the figures it can uh, produce is uh, savings to the National Health Service. I want to move on to two other areas of research which I think are important and this first one is very recent it was carried out in June by the Olympic Legacy Park and during Covid-19 they were able to monitor how important parks and green spaces were to uh, local people and the, 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 the staggering thing about that so many people in London lack access to a garden or or even a, um, a balcony. So the parks and green spaces in London are really important. And one of the main benefits that people reported to, to gain from going out uh, in the absence of other destinations being opened up like pubs and shops, etc., was just to get out of the house but also to get fresh air that was one of the main reasons why people uh, so appreciated going to their parks and the other thing that's been interesting uh, through that research uh, links are, are going to be available for you to look at it yourself is that more younger people have been using green spaces than ever before and finally the thing i wanted to draw out of that was that um, people have discovered local spaces, uh, local green spaces that they didn't realise were there and those were in walking distance from their homes. So we're, we're learning a lot from uh, the COVID experience. Another piece of research that was only launched a few weeks ago um, and more than research, it's almost uh, like a campaign, which is has um, being produced as part of Future Parks Accelerator um, it, and uses all the good words in terms of building back better um, uh, ur through urban green infrastructure. Um, this piece of work are, is very bold in asking for £5.5 billion nationwide to invest in parks and green spaces to level up the inequalities that exist. It asks for three things, and I'm going to focus on just one. The first is upgrading existing parks and green spaces to provide basic infrastructure and uh, needs such as toilets um, that people need. The second is around uh, investing in green, greening urban districts, which is split into two, creating new green spaces, or as in this case, which I'll come back to, um, greening urban neighbourhoods through uh, greening streets. And the third was by creating large scale regional parks and forests on the urban fringe. This, this is, a, it's a, again, you'll have links to get to this, but it's really a useful uh, piece of work, which I commend to you. And it really addresses this issue of inequality of access. Um, I also want to commend to you work being carried out by uh, Meredith Witten uh, in her thesis of the need to reconceptualize our green spaces. And this, this is actually a, a very um, timely piece of work because we need to rethink the way our spaces are designed, managed to increase their multifunctional use. So, yeah. I hate to interrupt, just got about a minute left on yeah, time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I just leave you with uh, two tools that we've developed. Uh, I want, particularly want to focus on the health parks, which is a toolkit that you can go and use and do an audit on your green space. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be a green space, it can be grey space, which can give recommendations for how you can make it a healthier space. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Jimmy. Uh, we'll just go to one or two questions then from the... Uh, well, we've just got one or two questions anyway we'd like to ask you. Um, so based on some of the points that you've raised in your talk, Tony, um, do you think that parks and open spaces will play a more important role as areas to help restart the hospitality sector? Uh, with many outdoor events cancelled, are parks and open spaces a good location to safely allow some of these events to restart? Um, well, parks uh, throughout the COVID epidemic generally have always been open anyway. And so um, their importance is is only going to grow. I think uh, one in relation to its links with the hospitality sector is that because people can space out more readily, um, it's good for uh, where we have existing catering facilities um, and outdoor um, outdoor gyms and things like that. Um, so there's scope for increased use of those sorts of, of things. Um, with regard to, uh, did you, uh, second part of your question about, um, if, did you say about events? Yes, so um, with many of them cancelled, do you think they're a good location to maybe safely allow some of them to restart? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I, again, uh, in some situations, it, it, again, because they're outdoors, it makes it easier. But I think it's going to be a slow return, not just because of getting everything right to keep up with guidelines that the government is producing, but I think the public are very nervous about going out. Um, we hear a lot of news you know, about people m massing to pubs and things like that. But a recent Mori poll has shown that very high percentage of people are still keeping uh, back from going out to these sorts of things. And the demand for these types of events will not be as great as it has been in the past. But I anticipate that will change with time. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. We'll, we'll go for one more question then, um, just as we've got a little bit of time. Uh, so do you think that London's parks then might be discouraging cycling in a way by kind of potentially restricting cyclists from being able to cycle within them. So with the London Street, Street Space programme encouraging cycling uh, through the implementation of new cycle lanes around the capital, do you think that these should be incorporated within London's parks as well? Um, well, historically, um, most London parks um, should, pro should prohibit uh, cycling in parks because it's one it's the kind of thing listed in their bylaws but most most boroughs don't enforce that and they're keen for people to to learn to cycle and use um, use their bicycles in parks uh, and in fact over a, mm, decades we have been working with transport for London uh, on a funding stream uh, that's actually no longer running which was to create uh, cycling routes through parks so that people could make routes to shops or to schools by avoiding streets um, and that was well well attended um, not well attended well supported and well funded sadly as I said it, it's no longer carrying on but um, th there's opportunity for more more routes through parks but uh, I, I flag up a health a health warning really that it really needs very, very careful planning and it must involve consultation because parks have so many um, different users that um, you need to iron out potential conflicts and the design of them is actually quite uh, crucial in making them successful. So I don't see it in either or. I see that, you know, parks and green spaces are part of a bigger urban fabric um, of the green infrastructure and so it's, it, it's only right that walking and cycling around in and through them should be encouraged. Absolutely well thank you very much for your comments Tony uh, and yes for a very insightful presentation there. Um, great so we'll then just move on then to uh, Jacqueline Bleach of Global Urban Design is an urban design director and she'll talk about some of global urban design's placemaking initiatives and how they will be suitable for a post-COVID era. Over to you, Jacqueline. 
Thank you very much, Thomas. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This talk today is about the importance of green and open spaces with an emphasis on improving air quality in urban contexts. So throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, people have relied on parks and green spaces for health benefits, both mental and physical, in addition to promoting well-being benefits of green and open space. So there are a number of, of uh, benefits derive, uh, and we'll go through those in, in more detail. So parks and open spaces provide access to biodiversity as well as uh, fostering human nature interaction through the provision of wildlife habitats. So we've seen uh, birds and, and bees, particularly uh, over, over the pandemic period. We also have uh, benefits including mitigating the heat island effect. So parks and green open spaces can create microclimates which help with climate change. Uh, we can also grow trees to sequester carbon. Um, and our trees also serve to recharge our water tables and promote the formation of, of rain clouds through uh, biogenic, volatile, organic um, emissions. And there are a number of, of benefits uh, to those uh, in various, for various uh, tree, tree species. So selecting our, our species is important in terms of trees that improve air quality by absorbing carbon dioxide. We can also select tree species that uh, help absorb air pollutants as they grow effectively reducing smog. So uh, particularly the linden family uh, shown on, on this slide. There are a number of planning benchmarks for green and open space. So with COVID-19, there's been an increased renewal in calls for uh, space quotas. Natural England has created this aspirational accessible natural green space standard for towns and cities. And that's calling for accessible natural green space of two hectares, uh, no more than 300 meters from home, one accessible 20 hectare site within two kilometers of home, one accessible 100 hectare site within five kilometers of home, uh, one uh, accessible 500 hectare site within 10 kilometers of home and one hectare of statutory local natural reserve per thousand of the population. Now, what might these opportunities for green and open space look like? The three main strategies, we have the first one, greening our streets and cities. So we're planting street trees, we're creating new parks and green spaces, and that includes in areas that are previously paved. Uh, and we're also having more green walls and more planting generally. The, the second strategy is improving our existing parks. So we're looking at including more trees, planting more microforests to increase biodiversity, uh, improving wildlife habitat, uh, and helping with with climate change as well as all of the attendant benefits that we are we are talking about. We can also see the large scale creation of regional parks. So creating regional parks trusts to safeguard and preserve natural landscape uh, and environments and create new um, landscape environments and improve access for city dwellers to natural uh, and created green spaces. So this proposal shows uh, strategies for Birmingham and that creates links to existing landscape as well as new landscape, uh, creating over a thousand walking paths, a thousand cycling paths and other opportunities. We also have the opportunity to involve communities in a clean air initiative. So this image is from New York. It shows uh, an, an urban community garden um, that can contributes to urban green in the urban context. We also have individual initiatives. So for those of us um, who, who were fortunate enough to have individual balconies or terraces or patios, there's been an increase in, in interest in terms of growing and planting and having green and, and living things. And so individuals can play a role in greening their environments uh, within, within their control. We would also want to ensure that uh, in creating future 
uh, housing um, for sustainability, we want to have that option for private outdoor uh, space where people can also grow and access fresh, clean air. So within the UK context, uh, with facilitation of green infrastructure initiatives, um, we have a very top-down planning process. So the UK planning system is responsible for the delivery of new open spaces as well as park improvement projects, the quantity, quality and accessibility of open spaces, the assessment of open space and green infrastructure, improvements to the green network, including space-constrained urban areas, green infrastructure strategies, improving green space for social housing estates. Um, so, so that encompasses quite a lot. Uh, and with that said, there is the opportunity to engage with communities uh, as well as the third sector and plan green infrastructure to suit the needs of current and future generations. However, the decision to engage is, is really the purvey of, of local councils. Uh, that brings today's presentation on my side to a close. I just want to acknowledge and thank Hassa Reddy for her design research um, into the landscaping aspect of, of this presentation. And thank you all for your time and for your attention. Brilliant, well, thank you. That's some really good insights there into what the future of parks and open spaces can look like. Um, let's just do one or two questions then. Um, and just to get your thoughts on a few things. Um, so with urban areas expanding and the amount of green space decreasing within our cities, are there any examples of reclaiming green space for parks? Um, or do you think we're moving more towards the concept of green streets and buildings? So uh, an example of a, a hybrid between the two then. Okay, so we do have precedents where these measures are being tested and it's, it's very much in line with um, responding to climate change and, and looking to form a more green and sustainable future. So to give two examples, we have Endhoven City in the Netherlands. They are creating new green areas and previously paved streets and squares to improve drainage by soaking up heavy rainfall. They're also planting greenery to help cool the city and filter out harmful airborne pollutions. Uh, there's also Legacio District in Genoa. Uh, they are planning uh, new green spaces, parks, community gardens, ponds, wetlands, and connecting new and existing greenery to form a green corridor for increased biodiversity. They are also planning to implement rainwater harvesting and replace impervious services with permeable materials to facilitate the replenishing of the city's aquifer. Uh, so we can look at at really having, instead of an either or approach, a, a, a both and, um, and, and really seeking to green uh, and create green infrastructure in, in all areas uh, and all, you know, creating opportunities to do that. So we can also incorporate green into buildings and streets, um, which is necessary and needed as well. Uh, we have various examples in terms of designing in green walls, uh, creating rooftop gardens, creating pocket parks, um, and putting in street trees and vegetation, and really creating walkable green corridors, uh, which are really good practice, not only for improving air quality, but also for um, fostering exercise, uh, opportunities to socialize, um, and, and really reinforcing those human nature interactions. Perfect, thanks Jacqueline. So, um... Okay, so building maybe upon that then, um, do you kind of foresee with the potential rise in private car use given the current climate and the current crisis, um, do you worry that parks and open spaces might lose their tranquility and clean air that they potentially already have? Um, and I know that you mentioned in your presentation a few of the um, interventions that could be put in place to help address that, with like putting in trees, for example. Um, is there anything else that you can maybe... Uh, infer towards then around helping to combat that in any way or combat this threat? Well, from learn lessons, learning lessons from COVID-19, communities have actually seen the improvement in the air quality that reduced human activity has had on pollution levels. And many are unwilling to reinstate cars in their streets. We've, we've seen uh, councils employ some tactical urbanism uh, strategies and, and methodologies. Um, and neighborhoods are calling for better cycle and walking paths, uh, particularly with 
social distancing and uh, less reliance on, on public transport. And they're also calling for accessible, low and no carbon emitting um, public transportation uh, vehicles. So e-buses um, uh, and, and, and those, those sorts of, of, uh, uh, modes of modes of transport. We also have community members asking for the acceleration of electric vehicle charging points and the provision of infrastructure to support renewable electric vehicles. So uh, again, the opportunity to move towards um, low and no carbon uh, transportation uh, methodologies and, and methods and, and fostering greener, uh, cleaner, more sustainable transportation um, is, is something that I see I see going forward. Uh, at the moment, people are relying on personal vehicles, but if we can look at transitioning from fossil fuel powered uh, vehicles to again, electric vehicles or um, biofuels, uh, this may be a, a way forward for, for our future. Absolutely. Uh Thank you, Jackie, for your input there. Um, I can see that Ted Inman in the chat has said that there's an, an opportunity uh, a, uh, opposite the London Eye, I believe, um, for a new uh, 0.6 hectare green open space in central London. So that's really promising to see that more of these green spaces are going in place. Um, just to quickly then uh, wrap up, uh, Jacqueline, maybe one last question. Um, with public sector funding cuts becoming larger, uh, with who does the responsibility lie to maintain placemaking initiatives in parks and open spaces? Um, are there any initiatives or is there anything out there currently to help with this? Okay, so the local authority funding mechanisms that, that are, are still around as far as I'm aware, I believe NEST is funding Rethinking Parks, uh, that initiative. There's also the Future Parks Acceleration Program, which is funded by the National Lottery and the National Trust to support local authorities, find the models for management and income generation. Uh, local authorities can actually also look at funding for related policy priorities. So as you, you've heard from the presentation, while we're talking about clean air, um, there are attendant benefits uh, that, that some strategies will have um, on solving a number of different issues for local authorities. And this includes health, uh, climate change, biodiversity, flood risk management. Um, so again, it, it's a, an, a holistic approach to problem solving. Um, and so local authorities can, can sort of see what funding they have available that they can, they can uh, reallocate to, to, those, to those measures. There's, there's also going to need to be a reliance on more public and private partnerships uh, so local business sponsorship, uh, if, if it's at all possible, um, given that we're going into a global recession uh, with regards to the maintenance of park assets, uh, maybe even relying on corporate social responsibility initiatives for improvement um, once these, these businesses are located near or adjacent or creating park space. Uh, you will also need to really start to enlist community and management of public assets. And this can be done in a number of different ways. It could be through beautification schemes, um, competitions. But again, a real caveat here, and I, I need to stress this point, you need to allow communities to have more of a voice in the decision-making process and provide adequate support as well as capacity building so communities can shape and manage uh, green, green space. Absolutely. Well. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, for providing that really useful information and for a really, really interesting talk. Thank you, Jacqueline. You're most welcome. Great. Well, I'd now like to introduce Fiona Cool, uh, Project Manager here at Crossroad Partnership. Uh, Fiona manages the Healthy Streets Everyday programme. And Fiona will be talking more about green spaces and their role in our streets. Over to you, Fiona. Thanks very much, Thomas. So, Air quality is the largest environmental health risk in the UK. In London, two pollutants are attributed as the main source of poor air quality, particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide. And it is a well-known fact that road transport is responsible for a large portion of these emissions. In fact, there are numerous facts and statistics highlighting the negative impacts of air pollution and the detrimental effects of private vehicle use, some of which are presented on screen. 
However, research also shows the importance of addressing these issues. Studies have shown that greater exposure to green space can improve physical and mental health across all socioeconomic levels and genders, while surveys suggest that 77% of Londoners are concerned about local air quality. Despite this, many of London's streets and those across the UK continue to be designed with the car in mind. However, over the last decade, our views on the street have been slowly shifting. Streets are no longer being considered solely as a means of transport, but as places that people can use and enjoy. COVID-19 has emphasized this, changing the way that the world thinks about space, travel, health, and the environment. London, as we know, is no exception, with TfL's street space program being implemented at an unprecedented scale to provide safe, spacious streets that encourage active travel and reduce viral transmission. However, the importance of active travel is not the only lesson that this experience has taught us. The crisis has emphasized the critical lifeline that open green space plays for cities and their residents, providing free places for play, exercise, connection to nature, as well as acting as facilitators for social interactions and boosting the local economy. The pandemic has reinforced the need for our streets to become places for people, providing more open space, not just for pedestrians and cyclists, but also for leisure and social interaction. This in turn will help to clean the air that we breathe. For example, during lockdown, traffic across London has reduced by over 50%, as did hourly concentrations of NO2 in some areas. So how do we do this? Well, the Healthy Streets approach is a global policy framework that puts people and their health at the center of decisions about how we design, manage, and use public spaces. It aims to make streets healthy, safe, and welcoming for everyone by prioritizing people and their needs. Underpinning the Healthy Streets approach are 10 healthy street indicators that are used to create healthy streets. These are pedestrians from all walks of life, easy to cross, shade and shelter, places to stop and rest, not too noisy, people choose to walk, cycle and use public transport, people are safe, things to see and do, people feel relaxed and providing clean air. Incorporating green open space as part of our streets helps to achieve several of these key healthy streets indicators, particularly those relating to places to rest, things to do, feeling safe and relaxed, shelter and shade and enabling clean air. So what does this look like in practice? Well, CRP's Healthy Streets Every Day is a cross-sector project to empower boroughs, businesses and communities across London to deliver people priority healthy streets, increase cycling and walking rates and reduce emissions and exposure to toxic air. For example, the programme is helping our partners to deliver healthy streets initiatives related to urban greening, including green screening at Queensbridge Primary School in Hackney and the installation of two city trees in Waltham Forest. These use biotechnology to emulate the pollution reduction benefits of 275 urban trees. And you can see one of these on screen. Our partners have also delivered over 300 car free day events in 2019 where open space was reclaimed for people. And the program is also supporting three low traffic neighborhoods. If you want to understand more about the implementation and benefits of low traffic neighborhoods, CRP's Marlebone Low Emission Neighborhood Report is a really useful resource. Additionally, eight of our partners are implementing school streets and our school streets hotline service continues to be well utilized. The service has now been extended to the end of September and is available to all London boroughs. So if you're a borough officer listening to this presentation and would like to know more, please contact myself so that I can provide you with details of the service. My email is being provided in the chat and will be circulated in the notes from this live share. However, the Healthy Streets Every Day programme also aims to deliver Healthy Streets initiatives by providing public guidance and support. And I'm extremely pleased to announce Cross River Partnership's new Healthy Streets Every Day Parklet guidance as part of this live share. Details of the guidance will be provided following the session, including how to access the guidance upon its publication. The guidance aims to provide local authorities, businesses and communities with a useful resource to assist with the design and implementation of a parklet, addressing the lack of information that partners felt was currently available in the UK. Details are provided on the key processes and stakeholders required to implement a successful parklet, parklet and how they can be used to provide an adaptable, effective yet simple solution to help address some of the social, economic and environmental challenges that our streets currently face. So what is a parklet? 
At its simplest level, parklets are a temporary pavement extension that sit in existing parking bays. They were first created in San Francisco in 2010, and the first parklet in London appeared in Hackney in 2015. They are quick, low cost and flexible initiatives that incorporate the healthy streets approach, contributing to the healthy streets indicators presented on screen. So what are the benefits of parklets? Well, Tony and Jacqueline have touched on this, but there is a clear link between greening a city and improving Londoners' health and well-being. Additionally, CRP's Healthy Greening Report provides a summary of these benefits, as well as case study examples of greening across the capital. However, a well-designed and coordinated parklet not only provides additional green open space, but can also promote active travel, stimulate economic growth, and encourage community engagement. In fact, parklets can provide a range of social, economic and environmental ben benefits. For example, following installation of parklets in Stockport and Fitzrovia, users reported better well-being and improved mental health. Additionally, following a parklet trial in Perth, Western Australia, walking and cycling increased by 35%. And in Hammersmith Business Improvement District, cafes reported a 30% growth in sales following parklet installations. So what should be considered when designing and installing a parklet? Although our guidance goes into this in more detail, the table on screen shows some of the key principles that need to be considered, as well as those that enable a parklet to be tailored towards its aims and surrounding environment. In short, stakeholder engagement is critical. Working with local businesses and communities to create a parklet that is tailored to their needs will ensure that the parklet has momentum and could even lead to support in terms of funding and maintenance, something that is becoming increasingly important considering the current funding climate. For example, it may be possible to implement a parklet based on a private ownership model, whereby businesses or business improvement districts fund and maintain the parklet with local authorities acting as the facilitator, delivering the appropriate permissions, regulations and legalities of the parklet installation. However, it is important to understand that a variety of ownership models should be considered and it's not a one size fits all approach. Additionally, consideration needs to be given to the components and materials, ensuring that materials are weather resistant, structurally sound and recyclable where possible, will be important to guarantee that a parklet is attractive, safe and sturdy. Similarly, design elements should be provided to ensure that a parklet is accessible to all people, including the mobility impaired. However, designing a parklet can also be fun. Engaging the community and encouraging creativity is a great way to create a unique parklet that reflects local people and businesses. For example, working with local artists and designers to provide unique design features, or engaging with a local garden centre or gardening group when picking out planting. Don't be afraid to think outside the box. Some parklets have been really innovative, incorporating water fountains and solar panels into their design. Vienna's City Making Vienna Toolkit is one excellent example of enabling stakeholder engagement. Citizens are able to apply for and implement their own parklet using the toolkit, which includes clear mapping showing where parklets can be implemented, as well as clear guidance on rules and regulations associated with parklet design and implementation. So in summary, parklets provide a fast, functional and flexible solution to enable resilience. Not only can they provide many functions for different users, meeting a wide variety of different needs. For example, this parklet on the left by Meristem provides bike storage, a place for rest and relaxation, as well as space for the community to interact with nature and socialize. But they can also provide flexibility in terms of functionality throughout the day. For instance, a parklet could provide a sanctuary of green space for local employees during working hours, but then act as an area of additional outdoor dining for the leisure and hospitality industry in the evenings. This is highlighted by the second image where you can see movable chairs and tables. Finally, parklets also have the ability to adapt over time, reducing vulnerability to uncertainty and change. As we continue to ease out of lockdown, shift in terms of our needs and behavior will start to be realized. Uh, for example, 46% of Londoners think they will be more likely to go for a walk, run or cycle compared to before the crisis. This could result in a greater demand for cycle parking and a parklet can easily be modified to adjust to this demand. As a result, parklets can rapidly adapt to changes in both the short and long term, providing additional value and ensuring community and business resilience. 
Consequently, the importance of creating streets that are pleasant, safe places for all Londoners to enjoy has become more important than ever. Providing open green space through initiatives such as parklets will not only help to improve our economy, well-being and the environment, but it will also improve our resilience, ensuring a shift towards streets for all people to safely work, live and play. Thank you very much. And here are some other resources that you may find useful with regards to providing additional open green space. Great. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, some really great initiatives there, which aim to bring green spaces onto our streets. Um, maybe let's uh, look at one or two questions then. Um, so let's have a look to see then how, um, well, what is being done to help accommodate for social distancing within parklets, particularly during this time? Um, and with who does that responsibility lie? Um, sure. So uh, some parklet providers have actually designed parklets to enable social distancing by ensuring seating is provided with enough space. Um, also, for example, some providers such as Meristem have incorporated design features such as perspex screening and barriers between seating areas in order to reduce vi viral transmission. Um, I also think that physical distancing signage can really easily be incorporated into parklets to make sure that people are aware of the need to maintain physical distancing. Um, and dependent on the maintenance procedures as well, parklets can be regularly cleaned to reduce the likelihood of transmission. Um, however, with regards to the sort of responsibility, I think there is an element of this in terms of the design. So whoever's designing the parklet should make sure that, you know, there's space for physical distancing. Uh, however, we do need to understand that there's a level of individual responsibility um, and it's up to each of us to actually adhere to social and physical distancing uh, regulations and rules. So, Absolutely. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and maybe just one more quick question then. So is now a better time than ever to help uh, implement Lucy Saunders' Healthy Streets Indicators onto our streets? And how can local authorities and others implement these ambitious plans in a post-COVID era of massive funding shortfalls? Um, sure. So I think that the pandemic has highlighted that there's a huge appetite for healthy streets uh, with people wanting to walk and cycle more, as well as have more space to rest and relax and sort of for leisure. Um, so TFL Street Space programme is one way that local authorities can implement healthy streets initiatives as um, there's quite a lot of crossover between street space and the healthy streets approach. Uh, however, I am aware that there is an issue with lack of funding. So I think that as kind of Jacqueline referred to, um, working with communities and businesses is going to be really important to deliver healthy street schemes. Um, so, for example, I think business improvement districts could play a really big role in terms of potentially funding initiatives such as parklets to reinvigorate high streets uh, and local economies with authorities acting more as the facilitator and ensuring that the appropriate permissions and regulations are in place. Great, thanks Fiona. And we do actually have one question um, from the audience, uh, from Deborah from South London. Uh, Deborah's asking, um, are there any standout parklet projects that have included children and or the elderly in terms of design? And is there any advice in dealing with vandalism? Just about a minute on that question, Fiona. Sure, so in terms of standout projects, specifically targeted at children and the elderly. I'm not entirely sure on that one. I know that quite a few parklets sometimes are associated, I say this, I don't have examples, but I know that parklets can be associated with school streets. So I will have a look for you because I'm sure there are some out there. In terms of vandalism, um, I think actually it's been really interesting when we were doing our research as part of this guidance, we actually found that there wasn't that much of a link with vandalism because a lot of research showed that by providing parklets, you were encouraging more kind of local like sort of people to come to the street and actually it reduced vandalism and um, antisocial behaviour. Um, also, in terms of the actual parklet location itself, you can mitigate these sort of issues by putting parklets in areas, for example, where there's CCTV, public or private CCTV, for example. And also, if you're working with stakeholders, um, if, let's say, you have a parklet that is being maybe maintained by a business, that's just another element of ensuring that it's uh, kind of not having any issues with behaviour because you've kind of got that person or business on side to kind of watch over the parklet and kind of help in terms of maintenance and vandalism so I hope that helps. Absolutely thank you Fiona and apologies it was Andrew French uh, who asked the question of vandalism. Oh. Uh, Deborah we'll get back to you um, 
with a more comprehensive answer after this uh, live share. And also we can see there's a few other questions from the audience, but we'll get back to everyone uh, with an email and a comprehensive answer for you all after this uh, session. So great. Um, well, thank you, Fiona. Um, we've had some really insightful presentations today, and I hope that uh, all of you as an audience have enjoyed them and found them useful. Um, before we do finish and go to the final poll, uh, I'd just like to wrap things up with a question from our speakers. Uh, well, for our speakers, I should say. Uh, as we emerge into a post-COVID era, what role do you see parks and open spaces playing in keeping our air clean? So we'll go in reverse order to those who presented. And if we could have about a 30 second answer from you all, um, we'll start with Fiona. Sure. So um, I think the pandemic has highlighted the importance of parks and open spaces for both physical and mental health. And that going forward, they'll play an increasingly important role in terms of our recovery. Um, I also think that quick, cheap and temporary initiatives such as parklets will act as a kind of interim solution to provide more open space quickly um, and will act as the evidence base uh, to help kind of transition to more permanent parks and open space as part of our streets in the longer term. Absolutely. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, should we just quickly go to Jacqueline? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, parks and green spaces will definitely be a part of a multi-pronged approach to keeping our air clean. So as, as we spoke about um, being holistic, we'll also be looking at sort of sustainable buildings, greening our buildings. We'll also be looking at uh, greening our transport, um, focusing on uh, low and no carbon um, emitting uh, you know, uh, modes of, of getting around. So creating those walkable paths, those bike lane paths, um, allowing for people to to rest and really enjoy uh, nature as well as, as having um, a reduction in, in fossil fuel vehicles, so renewable energy vehicles and, and biofuels. So it, it's it's part of a, a multi-pronged approach and a strategy, uh, but definitely necessary um, to, to create that health and well-being. And we certainly need to look at levelling up uh, in terms of creating those green spaces in areas that don't have access, uh, don't have access now. Absolutely. Thank you, Jacqueline. And um, over to you, Tony. Um, I really like the concept of the parklet, and I think they provide us, uh, as we emerge from the post-COVID era, uh, era uh, opportunities to experiment. And because they're so flexible, um, you can almost do anything with them. And I think that, it, you know, we should really try some new things. Um, and because uh, the Cross River Partnership are quite involved with a large number of um, business improvement districts, I think the the delivery of those will be actually more uh, more possible because they've got access to funding they involve the businesses where there are which, uh, shops involved and things like that so uh, I think there's great scope for that and I really think the grey space being greened is going to be a key thing for this particularly as we try to uh, level up on the uh, on the inequality of access to green space particularly where it's just impossible to provide new green space in uh, densely uh, um, developed areas. Great, thank you, Tony. And then finally to Susanna. Thanks very much, Thomas. Um, I would highlight to everyone something that Tony mentioned earlier in terms of the natural capital accounting model, taking account of NHS savings. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are already pilots in place whereby GPs are actually doing green prescribing to prevent serious mental health and other health issues occurring and the more that we can align the green and open spaces agenda with um, NHS agendas in terms of prevention of major health issues then I think that that will unlock much larger budgets to help get more green into our cities. Absolutely, thank you very much Susanna and uh, from all the comments from the speakers. So great. Well, let's just then quickly switch to the final poll. It's a quick yes or no answer for you all. Um, so as we begin to ease out of lockdown, will you continue to make regular use of your local park and open space? 
So it'd be good to good to see what your thoughts are on, particularly as we know, well, we're able to go to a lot more places than just the park, aren't we? Well, great. I think it's a unanimous vote here. <laughs> we're all going to be using uh, parks a lot more, and that's a really positive result. So great. Um, let's then pop back, and I'll just point you in the direction to our next um, live share session. Uh, so this will be on Thursday, the 30th of July at the same time, 2 p.m. Uh, the topic of this discussion will be Ditch Diesel, Your Electric Vehicle Options Explained. Uh, so speakers will talk about why now is more of an important time than ever to adopt sustainable business and delivery models, uh, particularly with the fast approaching 2021 ULES expansion. Uh, so the event bright for this will be circulated in our follow-up email to you all tomorrow. So do watch out for that. Um, and finally, also, also a reminder for you to sign up to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to receive all of our latest updates here at CRP and our upcoming live share sessions. Uh, so as I've mentioned, the registration link uh, will be publicized by these platforms also. So do keep an eye out. Um, so this live share, uh, past live shares and all of our future live shares will be posted on our YouTube page uh, for you to view, with, uh, view whenever you want and for you also for you to share with whoever you want. Um, so as I've said, any questions you have, uh, always please feel free to get uh, in contact with any one of us. Our contact details are on your screen now. Um, any unanswered questions from today's session, we'll get back to you uh, very shortly with answers. And finally, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for some really thought-provoking presentations and a big thank you to everyone for tuning in and joining us this afternoon. Uh, remember to stay safe and see you all again very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>